let's begin in Nigeria, where Kaode Adeolu Egberto Kumu, the Inspector General of Police, IGP, has issued an order for the redeployment of Mohamed Bade, the Commissioner for Police in Imo State, to the force headquarters for special duty ahead of the Imo State Guba election scheduled for November 11, 2023. Olumuyua Adejobi, the force public relations officer, released a statement emphasizing the IGP's decision and its significance. Now, the IGP's decision to reshuffle the CP underscores the police force's unwavering dedication to uphold the rule of law and maintain strict neutrality uh, throughout the electoral process. And of course, Adejo B stated also further that the November 11th governorship elections in Bayelsa, Imo, and Kogi states, uh, the Inspector General of Police had ordered the distribution of 220 operational vehicles for election security management. Well, Ezenwa Mwago, and of course, uh, who is the chairman, Partners for Electoral Reforms, Abuja, and Chukuma uh, Okenwa, Executive Director, Lead Network Africa, also in Abuja, uh, joins me on the show today. Gentlemen, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much. All right, I'd like to start off with you, uh, Ezenwa. What uh, do you make of this particular move by the IGP redeploying the CP following, of course, uh, the fracas that happened uh, in the state between the labor leader and the police? Nothing. I make absolutely nothing of it. Uh, but thank you for having me first. Um, nothing, because these are routine processes that we see every time uh, we have elections, especially mm -hmm. obstacle elections. Um, it, it has first, a, a, one, there's a side to it. The first side to it will be to say, um, it, it then means that the commissioner of police uh, who is being redeployed perhaps has not lived up to his bidding and, and, and his oath of office as a commissioner of police in that state. Uh, that's the first impression that you give. Uh, because we deploy him means that if he had perhaps uh, concentrated on security provisioning and doing police services, you may not necessarily have to redeploy. Mm -hmm. Because the deploying shakes off uh, all the security arrangements that you have put on the ground. Uh, the new man who is coming uh, four days, five days to the election will need time to be able to uh, put a, a, a handle on, on a lot of things that are taking place. So we need to get to that point where we either sanction of our officials who are not doing what you see that is at stake is that everywhere you have a commission of police, they see themselves as an attachment of the governor's office. And their loyalty becomes to the governor of the state and not the Nigerian constitution and the Nigerian people who has set them up to do work in wherever they are posted. So we have to be grappling with the consequences of this redeployment. So when you say, what do I make of it? Uh, the way it's being couched is like it's some novel Okay, so the, the, the reason why I put it to you that way is because we know what happened recently in Emo State, where uh, they are, uh, the labor leader was arrested and uh, showed up after, I mean, after a few hours uh, with a swollen eye and was hospitalized, right? And of course, that generated a lot of national conversation, such that the Labour even threatened a nationwide strike with some demands being placed, one of which was that the uh, commissioner there be removed or redeployed or taken you know, uh, uh, from that particular state. And right now we are seeing this happen. So are you saying that there is no connection between that particular incident and what happened right now? You, I'm just saying that if you have followed the, elect, the electoral processes and the electoral, I mean, the obstacle elections that we have had, we've had redeployments at every point in time that we have had. I understand the, the, the call for, and I'm saying that, why do you always have to do these deployments? The, if you, the, you have realized that your men who you sent to work in states become appendages of the government in power in that state, um, it is important that there is something, something be done about that. I'm not saying it does not have a connection, but I'm telling you that these are 
actually routine processes. And I don't want you to make let, let it look like it's some novel thing that, that has been done. How will it impact security provisioning for the state? What will it mean in terms of deployment of this number of vehicles in a way that we can do a service delivery and cost implication metrics for the state? So if you say, for instance, you have deployed this number of vehicles, how will it impact on violence and, okay. and all of that malfeasances that we see? Will okay. the police officers and the security agencies... No, we would even get to the aspect of the police officers and, of course, the security uh, uh, deployment of about 220 uh, you know, uh, police uh, uh, vehicle carriers and all of that. But uh, I, 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 I just want to pause you for a moment, uh, Mr. Ezenwa. Let me, uh, Ezenwa, sorry. Let me go to, of course, uh, Chukuma and uh, take his thoughts on this. What do you make of this particular move? Do you think there's any uh, link, uh, some sort of linkage between what happened recently in Imo uh, with the Labour leader and what we are seeing right now? Uh, or is not just in any way, uh, it's just mere coincidental? Yeah, I think uh, there is a causal link, uh, and of course, uh, the nexus is obvious. Uh, Labor comes up with a demand, and we see the IGP uh, comply within the shortest uh, time of space possible. And this is commendable, uh, being that um, one of the most significant, but of course, with lots of anticipation, uh, that of election of Imo State is coming up you know, in one of the times, the best times to live in a nation where uh, currently uh, you will not just be talking about the usual conversation uh, between a PDP and APC, but this time around like a thought force, uh, which is the Labour Party. So this election is quite very pervertal. And uh, for the IGP to also come up with this gesture of complying with what is reasonably expected, especially when there are uh, um, accusations of the CP being compromised, acting in this matter, manner, I think it's very professional and highly commendable of the force. And it will, of course, to help to strengthen uh, the public image of the Nigeria police force. Mm. All right. Now, I, I would still like to stay with you on it. Now, talking about strengthening the image of the Nigerian police force, do you also feel that this move in any way uh, would have boosted the confidence you know, particularly of the people in the electoral process that uh, maybe, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the entire process would turn out credible. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That, that's one of the ways. I mean, there's no way like any government or, or government agency demonstrate credibility beyond that of the body language. This body language, by the pol police force has shown is neutral, appears to be what is needed to boost the confidence of the people to come up believing that the election is going to be free, fair, and credible. These are basically the three uh, assurances people need for them to make out the time, take the risk to vote when it is assured that it's going to be free, it's going to be fair, it's going to be credible. Because if at the end of the day, uh, one has the, 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 the issue that maybe the, the security uh, apparatus is going to be deployed to compromise the electoral processes, or that the electoral umpire is not going to be fair, or that maybe like the election is going to be marred by violence, or like vote, uh, vote buying or voter suppression, then, you know, th th there wouldn't be any assurance of free, fair, and credible. And that, of course, is enough to dampen the interest and the will of the citizens to exercise their franchise. And so I think uh, what the police force has done is just the right step in the right direction. And what makes it even more like a magic wand is the timing. I think the timing is very commendable. Mm. All right. Uh, I would like to go back to you, Ezenwa. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, security has the conversation of brown security has been you know, a major topic on the front burner. And just recently, one of the contenders in this particular election in Imo State, Achana was actually attacked, you know, on his way to a church a synod program uh, by some people suspected to be, uh, what I call it, uh, miscreants or thugs. But uh, uh, now, what do you make of the deployment of about uh, 220 personnel to uh, the polling uh, states? Uh, we also know what is happening in Kogi State, where there have been calls uh, as regards security concerns and all of that. Do you think 
to some extent, this is some sort of advantage or does it create some sort of panic and scare? I'll still beat back a bit to the point that I made earlier. And that point is the fact that in before this off-cycle election, there were, there were other off-cycle elections. Kogi, uh, these elections are caught other elections. That's why they are holding at different times. In the last Kogi election, there were a deployment of DIGs. The commissioner of police was redeployed. In Bayelsa, the commissioner of police was redeployed. A new one, a, a new person was sent. In a new state, in a new state, bomb boats were applied. We give the security, those who made security provision in a, a lot of comfort. And we don't hold them accountable in a way that makes these deployments you know, impact on security provisioning for the election. At the end of the day, we will come back and say, oh, the, the whole idea of redeployment during elections, as much as it gives this dummy feeling that something has been done, in reality, in the way that security impacts election is in many ways, first and foremost, is punctuality index for the distribution of materials from one point to another. If the police do not escort materials from one point to another, the post will not open on time. If this police continues to make the arguments that they need the, the consent of presiding officers before they can make arrests, then criminals who work within a, 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 the election environment cause chaos and get away with it. So the point is these things are, are good feelings. They are, they, are, they are things that create good feelings. But if you are a participant observer in the electoral process, you will see that what you are going to see is these figures. Who takes the count? Who takes the count of these 220? Who takes the count of the men? You are going to see more deployments at INEC offices rather than you are, than you are going to see in, in polling units in the hinterlands. So the challenge for me is not the excitement of all these redeployments. It will, it will is not going to be any magic wand. What will be a magic wand is to ask the police authorities in the inter-consultative committee on election security to ensure that they coordinate activities in a way that the people who will be coming out to vote on set of day will have that feeling that they can come out and they will not be hurt. And the responsibility will be on the chief executive of those states. If the political temperament of the chief executives of those states are not one in which they want free, fair, credible, acceptable, inclusive election, the political temperature in that state will be very high and up. And so it's important that it's not just the, the, the police. The police is the lead against in this intelligence consultative committee on election security. There are other players, the DSS, the NDLEA, the, the, the civil, uh, the, the, what do you call them, the NSCDC, all of them playing in this security provisioning need to be up to their games. And what we have seen in the past is the banding of these numbers, and it does not, in the end, impact in the quality of security provisioning that we see in those states. Okay, so, so it's important if, if, that we don't if, come back later to have these conversations and say, oh, what has been this? In fact, at a, at a point in time, we are quarreling with this redeployment. We are saying, can you allow the men who are on the ground to organize these elections? But in the particular case of the Imo state, where you have a commissioner of police who unarguably has shown himself to be completely unprofessional and partisan in the way he has handled security provisioning in that state. So it is okay that that is deployment. But what the point I am underscoring is that we should not make a fun fair out of it. We should still be holding them accountable to say, if you deploy 220,000 and 40,000 men to man election in Ibo State, for instance, at the end of this election, we will have to do a cost-effect analysis of whether these numbers that you deployed actually impacted in the quality of security provisioning that we have. That, that's the thesis that I'm putting forward. Uh, I mean, you, you've said quite a number of things, but, but if you know, we are to get you correctly, uh, what you're saying is that 
most time, particularly from uh, you know the the past uh, experiences that Nigerians have seen or that you've witnessed, is that most of this security redeployment and of course uh, the uh, uh, introduction of uh, extra hands or security hands, you know, into states, you know, that are going through this particular electoral season. Most times, it's more of a cosmetic approach with little or no uh, a tangible outcome. Now, for you as you know, a key player when it comes to election observation and also public enlightenment. What are those parameters that you think should be ticked to ensure that the process is credible and smooth? The first important thing, if you are discussing security, is at the end of the day, we should be able to know the number of arrests and the number of prosecutions. Mm. We should be able to know how many people were arrested so that this number of men will not become just a routine process where people just make the argument and say, oh, we deployed 40,000. At the end of the day, you see... Is that why are you there? Okay, uh, of course... Uh we will uh, connect with SNY. But uh, let's move to Chukuma right now. I mean, you've had uh, the conversation, but, uh, I mean, some of the high points SNY has raised. What is your take concerning deployment of personnel and also uh, the movement of, uh, will I say, uh, I mean, security apparatus from uh, state to state or, you know, bringing in extra, you know, hands when it comes to political seasons like this? Do you think uh, it's commensurate in terms of the quality of, uh, elections we get in the country. Yes, yes, I, I see a nexus uh, between uh, hiding security and, of course, uh, the outcomes. Uh, judging from the previous elections, I would tell you that the off-cycle elections in Nigeria has been one of the freest, uh, fairest, and the most credible sets of election. Uh, like we saw what happened in Anambra where like there was that palpable fear that even perhaps the government at the center uh, was going to take advantage of um, you know the, the, the power at the center or upturn the process but of course that did not happen eventually we saw like um, a free fair and credible election delivering on uh, the people's choice right mm -hmm. uh, so that is what i also want to see you know that, that's what is going to likely play out because Apart from like uh, the security that will be deployed, don't forget since the off-cycle elections are not happening, uh, like the general elections, uh, big stalwarts in the different political parties will have to come in into the state involved. So we are going to see some governors, some APC governors, PDP governors, Labour Party, everybody, virtually every stakeholder will be interested in the electoral process, and that is going to, you know, eventually. Uh, enhance the credibility, the outcomes of the elections. Mm. Now, I, I mean, staying on security, how much of, uh, will I say, uh, security or attention uh, would you say exists in this particular state? We know that, for instance, in Kogi state, uh, uh, the parties, uh -huh. some of them have spoken about security concerns, uh, particularly, uh, you know, threat to life of some of the candidates and party members and all of that. Uh, we also seen, of course, uh, cases to uh, spring up in Emo State. Now, in terms of the security atmosphere of some of these states in this season, how, uh, do, I mean, is it, is it unusually heightened or uh, is it, does it warrant the kind of uh, uh, security attention we are seeing from the IGP? Yeah, of course. In fact, especially for Kogi State, uh, the outcomes in previous election uh, was not palatable at all. Because despite uh, the presence of security, in fact, what literally happened is that security was compromised in the case of Kogi election. We even saw a case of like uh, where like a deep trench was, you know, uh, uh, created allegedly by powers that be to stop uh, electoral officers from assessing, you know, where a very big local government where like there was a planned rigging, right? So and there were also like cases of uh, allegedly. Uh, seeing security men running with ballot box in the last Kogi election. So some of those concerns of either thuggery or like rigging of elections, they are real. 
And uh, what the nation could actually do is to find out where were the loopholes in the last Kogi elections. Uh, but I think for pretty other states, it was relatively uh, more peaceful, right? More coordinated in the case of Imo states. Uh, what we could allege is, okay, what were some of those things that led to an inclusive, inconclusive election, eventually now submitting the will of the people to the discretion of the court? Because I think one of the unsafe things that is happening in our democracy is where we have like people's will all of the time being either, you know, have to now be uh, either validated or quashed by a court. The court is not there to vote. The court is not there to decide who should rule. You know, and the more of such we have, like court actually deciding who becomes governor, the unhealthier it becomes our democracy. What is reasonably expected in democracies is when you lose, you know that the election was credible enough. And what is now reasonably expected in the spirit of sportsmanship is to congratulate your opponents. Mm -hmm. But when we have litigations upon litigation, like we know that, uh, you know, like fondly in Amos states, jokularly on a lighter mood, you know, they refer to the current administration as a a Supreme Court uh, 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 governor, right? So mm -hmm. we want to see, let people's votes count now. Let there not be including inconclusive election in different local governments. You know, I next should do the due diligence. Security forces should all ensure. People should turn out and mass. All political stakeholders, you know, should be able to also get involved. The media, civil society, and let's have emo people deliver on their mandate. All right. I think I would like to stay with you on emo state. I mean, uh, right now, we are beginning to see a trend where after elections, even though we know it's not new, but uh, there's so much attention to that right now uh, when it comes to uh, people taking, you know, uh, petitions after elections, you know, to try uh, tri uh, tribunals and, of course, uh, all the way to Supreme Court. And at the end of the day, we see a situation where it's, uh, the, the decision by the judges or the judiciary versus the will of the people. Now, uh, should we expect uh, such cases like we've seen in recent times uh, in this particular of cycle elections again? Yeah, well, I, I do not expect uh, as much as that. Granted that uh, we would have expected also that I neck would like they have reassured Nigerians once more hmm. uh, that the IRF is going to work. Okay. Uh, the divas will be very functional, right? And uh, if they have all of the support of the security apparatchik, uh, then we are sure that it's very obvious that when you lose, you know you lost gallantly, right? You'll be happy to congratulate your opponent. But when it seems as if to say, like, we can't really say, even when you lose, but you know that maybe I neck did not follow his guidelines, or there are some local governments where things was not done, there were issues of voter suppression, then you want to fight back through the courts. And if you have all the wits, you know, and uh, the legal machineries, you could even pull the whole process to your favor, uh, despite the fact that it might be obvious on the street that uh, your opponent uh, visibly got more votes than you. But that's the kind of thing we're beginning to see. Uh, we are uh, winner of elections that are decided based on technicalities, uh, not based on the realities that are on ground. Mm. You said elections are based on technicalities and not realities. On Would you like to, you know, uh, shed more light on that? Yeah, of course, uh, when it gets to the courts, so the courts could either choose to review things on either moral grounds, or which they call by substance or merit, or to look at the technicalities, maybe looking at, okay, what you didn't do in terms of, like, evidence, because he that alleges the onus of proof is on here that alleges, and in most cases, providing those uh, evidence uh, to a very reasonable extent that if the judge actually does not want to bring in the substance of the case, becomes mm. a very difficult one. But the reality of it is that world over in a democracy, the people should decide their leader. There's no law anywhere that says courts should give us a leader. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any justification for the amount of investment we make in our neck and in the conduct of the elections. So, so well, I'm really sorry, so who should be held maybe. accountable? Because, I mean, talking about justification of funds, we know how much Nigeria sinks into elections uh, every election cycle. And, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in very, very astronomical numbers. And at the end of the day, I mean, there are still complaints, right? And that leads me to my next question. 
How prepared do you think INEC is this time around? Yes, they've made promises. Oh, the BVAS is going to work. We saw that happen during the presidential elections where that promise was made. And then they went back to say we are not compelled to transmit results via the BVAS. Is INEC ever accountable in any way? Well, I think uh, on that ground, actually, you know, one of the things actually we feel is when the when can something be said to be a law? Yeah, because if the law actually limits and starts with the constitution, then it would have been right for INEC to say, well, uh, the law only said we could uh, maybe transmit result and, you know, I mean, we can we can transfer results, not necessarily transmit, which is an electoral, uh, I mean, a, an electronic process. Now, if the law empowers INEC, to set his own guidelines. And INEC comes up before the election, sets up a guideline, and that was funded through a legal process of making it a law for INEC to get the fund they actually need to invest into those machines. At the point of executing a budget, it's no longer a mere document or bill. It is now a law. Mm. So if the law has apportioned a specific form and said, do this process, through this to make a free and fair election. If anybody now comes up tomorrow and say, INEC is not compelled by the Electoral Act to uh, 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 to use BVAS or, or or maybe the IRF, then I, I think that is somewhat fraudulent because the question will now be, what, what then is the law? Is INEC a law in itself? Or is even the judiciary, are they not lawmakers? They are just there to interpret the law. So it, to me, it's a very simple process. If the law empowers INEC as an independent body to come up with guidelines, and they did, it's well tabulated, it's well written, they set the guideline, explain all of that to all the parties that are involved. And then at the last moment, they said, well, we are no longer using that, and one court comes up to defend that. I, I really think that the court is now making laws, no longer interpreting laws. Mm. So how does the law make INEC accountable at the end of the day, how do we ensure that, okay, uh, you cannot just, uh, even though you set the tone or, you know, or the agenda for, for elections, you know, the, the terms, the, the, the conditions and all of that, how is INEC also accountable for the monies, you know, being disbursed into the process and the results, you know, gotten at the end? Who holds that body accountable? Yeah, in all earnest and in all sincerity, like we see that uh, INEC truly was held accountable by parties involved, those that were disgruntled and felt unsatisfied. What was not reasonably expected uh, of the judiciary is to look at the merits of the case and ensure that those that you know played with taxpayers' money, played with the trust of the people, you know, and, and I'm happy also that uh, even in the final judgment by the final arbiter, they were able to see the nexus between what INEC did and voter apathy, voter confidence. Yes, you know, you know, the, the judge actually admitted that that this is likely going to impact further on voter confidence. So why will INEC now that is supposed to be a body that we encourage more uh, electoral participation by coordinating a free fair and election now become an instrument for voter apathy? where Nigerians would be reluctant to express their franchise, their right to select their leaders, because some you know, people within uh, INEC chose not to follow the rules of the game to ensure that Nigerians feel that they are not just coming out to waste their time. So I think it's a problem. I'm like, we saw, uh, I think that was in um, Kenya, if I'm correct, you know, an electoral umpire that tried to play with the will of the people and we know where he is at the moment. But in Nigerian own case, someone played with an election by just the, the what I'm even talking about here now is institutional integrity of saying, we would follow this process and you didn't follow that. Mm. And the same body is also coming up to say, well, just after some few months, that the one they failed, the promise they failed on, they will not do it again for another election. You promised to transmit results, you never did, and you are coming back with the same promise again with the same mouth again, with the same set of people again. And you are telling the same thing to the same set of Nigerians. So what, what, who is fooling who here? So I think it, it wouldn't happen in a, in a nation where people take things seriously. Mm. 
All right, now let's talk about the, of course, uh, voter behavior in this, in some of these states, particularly uh, some of them that, uh, I mean, security concerns have been raised, the likes of Emo and Kogi State. How would you, uh, I mean, predict, if I may use the word, uh, voter behavior on that day? Should we expect people to come out in mass, um, I mean, given their dissident and also uh, recent trends and all, or should we just expect people, you know, uh, a situation whereby uh, maybe, just maybe, we don't have, you know, uh, people come out on that day? Yeah, people will turn out like, uh, you know, one of the elections I'm excited about is the off-cycle elections, because they're also disruptive in nature. The first question to us will be, why are they doing the elections at a different date from others? Mm. The reason is because there is a level of political consciousness and awareness in those states. You either have a case where somebody was dissatisfied with the process, took an opponent to the court, and after maybe one, two, three years, a stolen mandate was recovered. That shows you it's not just one of those states where people just cry when their mandate is stolen. But people are politically conscious. People are ready to impress on whoever they believe they voted in to recover the mandate. That's number one. Number two, also, the very fact that all eyes are usually on them. So it's not just a case of maybe some international observers coming and staying in Abuja. This time, all international observers, local observers, all eyes on those states. More security forces are deployed. This one is not like general election where you are looking for like a way to really make up and probably you have to bring in more, you know, even paramilitary to get involved and even the military in the electoral process. This time around, you have fewer states, right? Mm -hmm. In some cases, it could be one state having an election. So you, you have all the luxury to do all of the security deployments and give the election all the needed attention for people to actually select the leader. And sometimes I've even thought in time past, given the level of success we've seen with this off cycle election, it wouldn't really be a bad idea. States are independent as much as they are interdependent. Running our statal elections with different calendars. Let every state has its own time. I mean, it won't be a time like maybe we take one state in one week. What's even the idea of a general election? When we know we don't have all of the security uh, apparatus to spread across, even INEC will have to like start getting ad hoc staff when there is a general election. But this time around, INEC will have to work with their, their top their, their, their top cadre, including Jega is practically involved in state elections because it's not a general happening. All the top who is who, those in the IT units, sectorates, they must get involved in those elections to deliver free, fair, credible elections. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And of course, uh, we just hope that uh, at the end of the day, uh, the will of the people uh, is brought to bear. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've been having conversations with uh, earlier uh, SM Wago Chairman, Partners for Electoral Reform, Abuja, and uh, just also Chukuma Okemwa, uh, Executive Director, Lead Network Africa, also from Abuja, Nigeria. We'll go on a quick break. When we return, we, have, we still have more to talk about. Stay with us. Okay.